of my specialties in the nervous system and in particular the retina. Um, I'm interested in a type of uh, retinal diseases that involve retinal degeneration and that means the loss of cells in the retina. In particular, we're talking about the photoreceptor cells and those are the rods and cones you heard about uh, a long time ago. And these are the cells that actually detect light. When these cells die off, you can't detect light anymore. Ipso facto, you can't see very well even though 99% of your visual system is still there and intact and functioning. So we're trying to look at the possibility of either preserving or replacing those cells. And I'll be talking about that right now. Um, so I'll just introduce again a little bit about these retinal degenerations. The classic type of retinal degeneration is something called retinitis pigmentosa. This starts... Uh, okay. Maybe I'll sit down because yeah. uh, <laughs> it's the best way. Um, so this starts out with a degeneration of the rod type of uh, photoreceptor. It cascades into a problem with the cones. And eventually you lose all the photoreceptors. But the progression is such that it starts as a type of night blindness. So you only have trouble at night. And then during the day later, you start to have this tunnel of vision effect that you see here, where the periphery of your visual world is shrinking. You still have uh, intact vision in the center, and then unfortunately, eventually, that goes away too. Uh, the other type that's much more prevalent is called age-related macular degeneration. Um, the symptoms of this condition are actually the opposite. Um, you don't have trouble with night vision, and you don't have tunnel vision, but you have um, a problem right in the center of the vision, although the periphery is intact. Um, and so, um, although these symptoms seem very different, the diseases are related because they have in common this problem of a loss of photoreceptors. And this is just a scientific slide showing the rods and the cones in a normal, healthy retina. And then here we see somebody with retinal degeneration in which the, there's a few kind of misshapen photoreceptors left, but um, in general there's been a noticeable loss of these important light-sensing cells. So what are we going to do about it? Well, we're pursuing simultaneously two different approaches. The first is a type of drug delivery to try and get the, the photoreceptors to stop dying in the first place. Um, because the reason for their death is a little mysterious. They don't have an actual metabolic problem that forces them to die. They're actually told to die and they just obey. If we can jam that signal, we say, oh, you're getting the wrong message. You should actually survive. We think it would be better if you survive. Um, they, they actually listen to that. So we're looking at ways of sending in growth factors that are going to reprogram the cells away from this crazy idea of dying and just, just stay alive a little longer um, is going to make a huge impact. Um, and one way to do that is uh, microspheres that deliver growth factors. Another way is we can actually modify stem cells to deliver growth factors as well. Um, the other way is direct cell <coughs> replacement and particularly for people where photoreceptors have already been lost. Um, Preserving the ones that are left isn't going to be very helpful. I mean, it's helpful to the extent you want to preserve what's there, but you're going to need more than that. You want cell replacement. Uh, that's where stem cells come in, um, and I'm going to show you some evidence of stem cells, or at least a type of stem cell, can actually replace photoreceptors. Um, and if the retina is severely damaged, then there's also the possibility that we can use tissue engineering to actually re- uh, generate actual vast areas of the retina uh, so that the person can see again since the rest of their visual system back to the brain is still intact. Um, but obviously that's somewhat more um, advanced work and I'm not really going to get into that one today. But you see that I highlighted in yellow stem cells because stem cells play a role basically in each of the strategies that we're looking at. Um, so how would you replace a photoreceptor? You need a cell that's capable of becoming a new photoreceptor. And the cell that does that best is the cell that makes the photoreceptor in the first place. So we all started with no photoreceptors as a little ball of cells as an embryo. 
And at some point, we developed eyes, and the eyes developed photoreceptors. Well, who did that? Well, it was something called a retinal progenitor cell. So this is the type of stem cell uh, that's normally recruited by the body to make uh, photoreceptors. And we harvest these from the early immature neural retina. Um, they're a lot like stem cells, but you can't grow them forever. Um, but they can migrate and integrate into the diseased retina and they can make photoreceptors, as I'll show you. Um, so I'm going to first show you some early work in mice. We're going to progress through the kind of evolutionary tree and that will bring us to humans. Um, so here are green mice. We started with green mice because they're green and that way the stem cells are also green, fluorescent green, um, because of a jellyfish protein that's been engineered into the animals. This allows us to find the cells after we transplant them and I'll show you some of that. Uh, meanwhile, we can analyze the cells and from the molecular profile, we see that these cells are, are the right kind of cells for developing new retina. Here's some example of green mouse stem cells that have been transplanted. Um, you see some cells integrated into the retina here and actually making some synaptic-like connections in the right layer. Here's a photoreceptor-like cell. It looks very much like a rod. And here well, you see a clump of rod-like photoreceptors and the red points are actually synapses that they're making in the host mouse retina. So it looks like they're making cells in the right place. Um, we wanted to know if they functioned and we put our transplanted mice onto a running wheel test to see if they could detect light. Um, and I'll just, we're a little short on time, but we showed that the transplants actually um, in blue had increased light sensitivity compared to um, the, the diseased blind mice. In this case, a higher bar is a worse effect. So it's kind of backwards, makes it hard to understand, but this is what blind mice look like. Here's transplant mice are better than that and the fairly normal mice are even better. So based on the idea that we can repopulate photoreceptors and that they can have a visual improvement to the recipient, uh, we moved up to pig model. Um, it turns out there is a, a green jellyfish gene transplanted pig, or transgenic pig, and so we were able to get green pig cells from these animals and subject them to the same kinds of analysis to make sure that these were the cells we were looking for. Uh, we can transplant these to the retina, and again, we saw photoreceptor cells, and here we're showing different photoreceptor-specific proteins that these cells are making after transplantation. Um, so uh, we also were very interested in whether we can uh, replicate this kind of data from a, in a human. Um, so, starting with donor human tissue, we're able to grow human retinal progenitor cells in the dish. We uh, can do the various molecular analyses and show that these cells, again, look very much like what we were expecting. They have the profile of a retinal progenitor cell. <coughs> so, uh, they should be able to do something. Um, and transplanting these cells into mice that have their immune system shut down, uh, those mice were able to get some integration of the human cells in a mouse retina. These are blind mice that are also immune incompetent. So it's kind of like a, a blind mouse with AIDS, if you will. It's incapable of rejecting the human cells. And these cells are repopulating. The human cells are in green. They're repopulating the mouse retina, which is in blue. And they're expressing photoreceptor proteins like rhodopsin, which is the molecule that actually detects the light. And that's in red here. So we have human cells in a mouse. They're making uh, processes into the retina, and they're able to make the protein that detects the light. Um, well, that's great, but um, what about in humans? There is some early work in China where cells of this type, human retinal progenitor cells, have been transplanted into patients with retinal diseases. Um, this data shows that the cells will survive without immune suppression. So, in this case, if we transplant from human to human, it turns out we don't have to worry about rejection the way you would if you were transplanting a kidney or a liver. 
in that case, you have to knock the patient's immune system down so that they'll tolerate the graft. Um, that's obviously a somewhat dangerous thing, and so it's very uh, hopeful for us that we can transplant cells without knocking down the patient's immune system. There's also some early data suggesting behavioral visual benefits in these patients from the transplanted cells. Uh, we don't know yet what the mechanism is. It's much harder to prove in a patient what's causing it than, than what you can see in a, in a mouse, but um, uh, that's the right kind of result that we were hoping to see. Um, so again, the targeted diseases are mainly the retinal degenerations, retinitis pigmentosa and age-related macular degeneration. We think this kind of therapy will also have benefit in retinal detachment, and it could also work in certain types of optic nerve degeneration. That includes glaucoma and uh, certain optic neuropathies, but uh, that's a topic for another day. So thank you for your attention. For a few questions that people might want to ask. Yes, is it true that someone with macular degeneration won't go totally blind? No, yeah, that's correct. Um, you should repeat the question, I think. Will people with macular degeneration go totally blind? Not from the macular degeneration. So there's no guarantees in this world that you won't get hit by a meteor, but you know, the macular degeneration <laughs> is just limited to the macula. So it's the macula that degenerates, and that's similar to the phobia. In other words, it's the central vision. So the periphery is intact. Yes? Uh, does this affect the retina when you have an infection like uh, shingles or something? That not Shingles, um, yeah. Shingles can leak. Can you repeat the question? The question is, um, to what extent what I just talked about overlaps with, uh, say, a condition like shingles. Um, shingles isn't a characteristic uh, retinal degeneration, but it does give rise to something called acute retinal necrosis. And in that case, the retina degenerates, it's not just the photoreceptors, but it's quite a few cells within the retina. You can even get a retinal hole and a detachment. Um, so anywhere you have cells dying in the retina, this is a potential therapeutic uh, intervention. Obviously, the more damage is done, the, the higher the bar in terms of getting a beneficial effect. And an acute retinal necrosis is pretty nasty. But I think, depending on how extensive it was, um, there's, a, there's room for potential benefit. It, it might be a case for the, the tissue engineering. I think this was first. How, how long might be before human uh, testing in the United States? Is? United States. Well, so fortunately, we're getting some data out of China already. Um, human testing in the US, it's, it's really going to depend on two things. Uh, FDA approval and the funding necessary to give the FDA what they want to give us. Um, and that's a long way of saying I don't know. <laughs> but I, I, think, I think it's something that, that deserves uh, to be put on the front burner instead of the back burner. How, do, how does this chip uh, method uh, enter into the picking up compared to stem cell? I've heard uh, a lot about this chip and they're trying to second um, humans now, penicillin, that are taking this test, you know, the first one, the animal modification one. I uh, think maybe that chip will be more available before the... Uh, yeah, I think if you're brave enough, you can go get a chip now, um, but you got to realize they're talking about something like 16 pixels, which is... Um, Imagine looking at uh, 16 searchlights and trying to figure out what you're looking at. I mean, it's, uh, that's basically what you're doing. I'm, uh, as a disclaimer, I'm not doing chips. Yeah. And I have no reason to, uh, you know, pump that into the, that perspective. But um, I think, you know, obviously electro, uh, electronic technology is extremely advanced. And it would be really great if we could just plug, like, uh, you know, that kind of video technology directly into our visual system. But therein lies the rub. It's the plug-in. That's the problem, the interface. 
it's just not happening. So they can make all the great chips they want, but um, you know, you still have to see it. <laughs> and that's that's just a huge limitation.